Hey folks, before I launch today, I wanted to go over something that is going to lead into a little bit more in-depth um, presentation specifics of crank baiting in summer. What I'm going to show you, and, and I do have a favorite crank bait, and I've been over that. If you've watched my top five um, river smallmouth summer river smallmouth lures video, you know that I really like this crankbait right there. Uh, what I didn't cover in that particular video is that when I'm on a good solid crankbait bite, I will have three rods, one with a subsurface, one with this medium diver, and one with a deep diver. And what I will do is rotate through these three depending on the depth of water that I'm in. So I'm here at the launch. I'm going to start with the subsurface. This one goes less than a foot deep. Looks like we've had some thunderstorms up here because there's a little bit of turbidity, a little bit of not totally clear water. Um, I'm putting down the subsurface because I'm coming up on a little bit deeper water. And, uh, I always like putting things on the upstream side of the, the targets that I find. And it looks like I got a, a branch or some kind of... I don't know what that is. It's hung up. And, you know, because I've moved into that three-foot depth range, I definitely want it grinding. Because um, if you ain't grinding, you ain't finding it. I mean, it's just, it's that simple. Um, but it may cause someone to ask, okay, so why don't you just always go with the deepest diving bait that you have or deepest, you know, deepest diving crank bait, because that's always going to be grinding, right? That's true. Um, but you have less control. If you don't match, you know, less control of the retrieve and, and where you're, you're steering that bait. When you, uh, when you have a deep diver that absolutely just starts grinding away in, in a mid or shallow depth uh, because it'll turn sideways on you instead of coming straight at you or the direction that however you're steering it. And I do like to impart, you know, directional changes um, and changes in pause, start up again. My motor just found some rocks. Anyhow, I'm in that mid-depth range now, and I'm using that, you know, the, the medium diver to target this area. When I go shallow again, like when I come up on these, these grass beds and I know it's real shallow right above it, in fact, let's go do that, I will switch back to the subsurface. this ready and I'm looking at my tips and uh, it's fouled up this one isn't ready but that's not the one I'm throwing it's a medium diver I put that down you always want to hit the upstream side of whatever objects you can in summer in this case it's a ledge line and they'll hang out right above it I wish I'd have gotten that a little bit closer than I did I'm going to use the motor and kind of ferry my way across and keep, keep tossing this uh, subsurface into that push water, water that's accelerating before the drop. All right, nothing along in that push water. What I want to do is target, I'm going to get my motor up so I don't bang my way into the spot. Just lifted it. I'm targeting what I refer to as a double feature. So this double feature of, you know, one, one cover structure followed by another one is the ledge line, this top side that I just worked, the upstream side, and then the, the second feature in the double feature is uh, this grass pole here on my left. So we're still shallow. I'm moving in. 
taking too much time to talk and not, not enough time to jump right into casting. Um, I like getting into that uh, immediate upstream side of the second feature of the double feature. So this double feature is something that shows us two of my favorite things to target in uh, especially the, the morning hours of summertime. We got white water and it's gentle white water but it's still you know highly oxygenated um, area where there's a whole lot of food in this area. Halgrimites, crayfish, mad tom, sculpin, garters, everything. Lots of food here. But as we move down uh, we have the grass beds and the upstream side of grass beds can be just absolutely deadly this time of year. I mean it's where they they chill out and um, look upstream. The root structure of the, the grass beds, you know, keep it fairly high, but on the immediate upstream side of them, frequently it's scoured out and it's there's a scoop out where the roots aren't holding things in place quite as well. And it can be, you know, two and a half, three feet deep on the on the upstream side of a grass bed like this. It isn't always, but the best ones have that feature, that deeper water immediately upstream. All right, I'm gonna go upright, put my sunglasses on. Been really happy with the loop hold. I think these are called the switchbacks with the bronze lens. platform here. Very good position to hit all of this. Oh, I see action over in the corner. What is that? Yeah, I gotta go all the way down there. There is for sure some uh, fish activity, things blowing up. Yeah, there's some activity in there. White water, play any kind. It's always a great concentrator of forage. Predator fish alike. And that one just showed himself to me. Alright, being able to stand up and look downstream to see the object upstream from that grass island was a huge advantage. I'm loosening my drag. This is a good fish. So, standing up gave me a nice long cast and let me see where I thought the smallmouth should be on the upstream side of that this grass bed here. And uh, it got, let me allow, allowed me to see the bite which is fun to see the wake take off and come get this, uh, this nice, oh, that's a good one. Nice uh, shallow water. I'm gonna put myself down easy. The subsurface crankbait. So let's take a look, let's let him breathe. And we're gonna take a look at where that particular fish was positioned. down. We're going to take a look at this guy. It's uh, know, a nice fish. He's probably, I didn't bring my, my bump board out, but I think he's in that uh, 19 inch range. I got one hook left in you. You're holding on to it pretty good there, fish. All right. Let you breathe. And then we're gonna let you go. You got a little bit of a sore on your mouth. This is a nice fish though. Yep. How'd you do that, buddy? Alright, I'm gonna let you go. And then we're gonna take a look at where he was. See ya. Um, as I mentioned, the 
the subsurface crankbait just made the most sense for this this spot um, because we got this grass here you can see the, the eel grass here and I kind of wanted to stay above it and not bog down into it so subsurface over grass uh, but that specific fish and I have the the grass bed on my right and this is immediately upstream current is coming through this way and uh, he was somewhere in this vicinity right in there I'm gonna paddle up and take a better look at it I can see a log over there it's probably some grass hung on the log which is a nice little canopy for him to hang out underneath it but there's another obstruction on the left so he was kind of in between the two and I really saw the wake of that fish moving out and uh, and crushing this subsurface crankbait it's a live target crayfish crankbait and um, the man's one minus and baby one minus will do the same thing as this let's go take a look at the spot it's maybe what is that two feet not even maybe that's two feet close to it uh, I got about a foot of water over here on the right splotchy grass He's right in this little pocket here when I saw I move that way for it. Um, got a log there. And what's fairly typical is two feet of water comes right into what is this gonna be? I mean it's it's ten feet away from than my paddle length so it's like 10 inches and getting shallower and, and swifter so don't ever think that you're going to go too shallow uh, with a subsurface crankbait uh, provided there's immediate access to deeper water which there was i think he came rocketing out of that 10 inches of water and uh and met the subsurface crankbait in two feet of water Gosh, I watched him come over and just sip at it. <laughs> oh, I missed him. He was still very green. That was a giant. I don't know what I should have done better with that one, but I saw his wake coming up. Darn it. drifted below these ledges now I'm in a little bit deeper water just change into the deeper diver it coincides with less grass so it just works out I just missed another big one oh. oh I actually sight fish this guy oh he's big He's a big, big fish. Oh, yeah. I saw him cruising up this bank and I led him by a good bit, by probably 30 feet. And he was gonna see it. So this is on the medium diving crankbait. And I just, I've lost two good ones in a row. And I just, I want that drag loosened just enough that, uh, He's not going to come unbuttoned. Get tired, fish. Come on. Keep towing me around. It's a good one. Let me get my, my net ready. I have no idea how many hooks I got in this fish, but he's a big one. He's a big, big fish. Aren't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get in there. That's a giant. Look at that. We're gonna get a weight on this summertime Susquehanna slob. All right, I finally got this one unhooked and uh, I forgot my bump board. 
but that thing is for sure a 20 inch fish. I did have the boga. I put them on the boga grip. It's rare for to find a fish that's uh, that's up here that's truly over five pounds. And this one's close. It's, you know, it's, it's as close as I've caught in, a, in some time. But for summertime weight, to get one that is four pound, 11 ounce, that is tremendous fish. And uh, it was nice to see him first and put the crankbait in front of him, get the right depth crankbait. I'm not saying he wouldn't have eaten the, uh, you know, the subsurface, but it was definitely grinding away there in the way that uh, he said, yeah, I like that. I'll eat that. All right, there she is, 4'11". Don't know the length. For sure over 20 inches. Thank you. Beautiful smallmouth. You go home. Go now. There she swims. All right, so this is an example of water that's too shallow for the medium diver that I need to switch over and I don't know if I'm going to be able to get get it to do what I want it to on film but what it does when you retrieve it back and that one actually looks pretty good but it'll start wandering off in one direction which means that the the crankbait is really you know tried to dig down but really just picked a direction and just turned sideways and is carving out a, a weird path and that's when you know you just if you're gonna fish that shallow water switch back to the subsurface so crankbaits will snag and uh, one of the nicer accessories I have for successful crankbait fishing is the Torquedo. You know, having three horsepower of electric outboard to zoom me back up to spots where, you know, I might have made a long cast upstream against strong current. And uh, just the freedom that you have with knowing that, hey, I can I can zoom back up and get that, that snag out of there. You just make more cast. You're just more aggressive with where you'll, you'll put a crankbait. And that's a good thing. So, I don't know if this is going to convey on video, but it's an important concept when you're sight fishing. You're going to see more stuff when the, the area that you want to look at, when the reflection of that is trees as opposed to the sky. You're just not going to see as much. And that's why I've, you know, I've swung out here away from away from the bank that I'm targeting because what I want to see as the reflection is trees. That darker reflection allows you to see what's down there. Even with the polarized glasses, I can't see what's underneath this. Maybe if I went higher, maybe if I stood up and I could get, you know, the, the tree reflection from this island to show me what's underneath there. But sometimes positioning yourself is the best thing you can do to to do really good sight fishing be able to see that fish like I saw that last one I guess I was just lucky that he was between me and the bank and the reflection was that was on the surface was trees and not sky you like to jump a lot Yep, that's what you do. You're a small mouth bass. So we have two very dominant ledges right here. And I'm still grinding, but here and there with the medium diver, I'm not reaching bottom in, in the deep area downstream from it. So I don't know what it's gonna be like once I get up above that ledge. Am I gonna find something that's even deeper? I may need to switch to that uh, that deepest diver. Give it a little bit of action today. You know, if it's if it's not real shallow and you're not grinding, it's probably a good thing to just have that other rod with the deepest diver you got. 
and uh, and reach it. It's the deflection that gets them to eat. It's the the crashing and, and just bouncing off at a weird angle that that gets them to eat. And if, if it's in open water, if it's not banging, which right now that one's not. I'm gonna switch. Now it's banging, but through much of the retrieve, it must be deeper than the, uh, well, I think this is supposed to be four to six. So here and there, I'm getting to deeper than six, I bet. Okay, I see one in front of this rock. I just let him by eight feet. He's still there. Come on, fish. Oh my gosh. That was like right underneath me. Like I cast to the other side of that, this rock here. Get you turned around. Okay. You got friends too. Like he's right there. I don't think my cast was more than like 10 feet out in front of me. That was fun. But yeah, that's what I mean. They get on the upstream side of things. So running a ledge like this, casting the crankbait parallel to it, right where it pours over is one of my favorite way to catch them in the summer. This nice oxygenated water, you know, there's just a lot of food in here. A lot of fun currents for them to play in and ambush all sorts of stuff from crayfish to pilgrimites a lot of bait fish life in these ledge systems and um you know it's, it's where they come to eat all right besides the uh the one fish i got right on the other side of the rock um that's you know that's been the only fish that i've been able to get out of this particular ledge trench really obvious um place that uh that really jumps out i'm sure lots of people fish it and uh i was trying to get a little bit deeper with the deep diving crankbait i certainly had the depth for that but uh i moved above it and then came back down and fished it and really decided yep that's that's the end of the deep water that i'm seeing so i will holster that put it back here and go back to the medium and subsurface So I'm advancing upstream, kind of swung all the way to this, this bank side and it got real, real skinny, skinny enough I couldn't get the motor to dig. It's kind of right on the edge of it being able to, to grab or not. Just keep paddling my way up through the inflatable paddle pretty easily. So much about speed as it is. How shallow you can go, how shallow you can keep going, and not have to hop out. I mean, that's. I just cleared something that's two inches down. Here, let me show you. I am not touching on bottom with that. I've measured it before. Two and an eighth is where I start rubbing. Two and one eighth inch. So I got two and a quarter. Right My motor can grab now. So we're gonna find some shallow eaters. Eat it! Preventative maintenance on your lines, on your knots. I just retied that end. Don't overlook the braid. If you use braid to fluoro knot, um, I'm gonna go ahead and replace both of them because as many casts as I've made today, this knot has absolutely taken a beating, and uh, it just I don't I don't want a chance losing another big fish because I didn't retie my knot. So the, uh, 
the subsurface one is getting a retie here now the the medium diver actually doesn't I don't use the uh, the, the fluorocarbon leader anymore and that you know that big fish earlier ate it on straight braid so that's kind of all the proof I need that straight braid is okay because the subsurface is up off the bottom a little bit I I still want that uh, that fluorocar fluorocarbon leader on there so it's important to retie both knots so you know I said earlier today you can never go too shallow with this subsurface crank. In other words, these fish like to be shallow. Uh, there is one, I'll say, condition, and that's that they have access to deep water. They'll be shallow in less than a foot of water, sometimes right next to some of it, sometimes, you know, two or three tail flips, and they're in, I don't know, four, five, six feet of water. Then they're happy. I don't think we have access to four foot deep water in this entire stretch. So I'm gonna keep moving up and uh, you know look for that deeper water because there may be little pockets of it here and there, but every one of the, the bigger fish that I saw shallow today or that I caught shallow has been shallow next to deep water. And I'm not seeing any deep water. All right, that's the two inch mark. There are limits even for the inflatable. Time to start dragging. friends no, just you all right thank you oh that one looks good uh, nice deep ledge yeah. airborne twice already I thought you were bigger. You got airborne. Ah, that one's been up a couple times. Loosen that drag. It's a solid fish, right where this little trickle was coming in down there. Come on, fishy. Stay buttoned. That moderate action rod is helping me as long as you can stay out of the wood. You tired yet? Oh yeah, you're a good fish. You're a good fish on the subsurface. Okay, just breathe. Just relax. 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 You're done. You don't have to fight. Chill. Catch your breath. That's out. Okay. The only hooks that are left are in the net. So if you get to go home. First, you won't get off that easy. Isn't that a pretty one. She's pretty when she jumped. Yes, you were. See you later.
could be big. Yeah, that's a good one. Took him a while to get mad and jump. coming towards me and I don't know how big he is. He may be big. Hitting the subsurface just out in the middle. Oh yeah, he's big. That's a big fish. Running out, big fish. Oh, he's off. Ah, uh, played him too long. Bummer. 